Welcome to LSEIQ, a podcast from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question about economics, politics or society. In 1964, the sociologist Ruth Glass coined the term gentrification to describe the process of London's working class neighbourhoods being taken over by the middle classes. Modest two-up, two-down terrace houses were brought cheap, done up and made into expensive residences. Once grand Victorian houses that had fallen on hard times and become lodging houses or homes to multiple families were restored once again and subdivided into luxury flats. Soon the working class residents had been squeezed out of the neighbourhood and its character changed completely. Fifty years on and this process continues apace in London and many other cities. In this episode of LSEIQ, Sue Windybank asks, is the gentrification of our global cities inevitable? Yeah, I'm Patrian Roman Velasquez. I am the sort of founder and chair of Trustees of Latin Elephant, but I'm also a senior lecturer at Loughborough University in London. We're sitting in the, in the shopping centre in the Elephant and Castle. Can you just explain a little bit to us, for someone who hasn't been here, what it's like here? The shopping centre is a really lovely place to be in for for loads of people who might have a job, might not have a job, might want to to, to meet a friend. Um, It is a a sort of social place as well as a a commercial space. It is where you can get goods at an affordable price. It is where you can meet a friend, um, socialise. There are loads of events also happening in the shopping centre. You don't come here, do you, if you want a Starbucks? No, it's not the sort of place you would come for in, in that respect. It's not that. That's what makes the area so special. That's what makes the place so special. It is loads of migrant businesses. Um, all, most of the owners are from um, different migrant ethnic um, backgrounds. You have Colombians, the majority, but you also have from Egypt, from Nigeria. Um, and people who have settled in this country, they are, you know, also British in that respect. So th- these are people who have made their way up you know, and escalate up, they're self-sufficient, self-employed, and they are trying and doing their best to be good citizens <laughs> in that respect. The Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre in Inner London opened in the mid-60s. It was the first covered shopping centre in Europe. Hit badly by the recession in the 1990s, Latin Americans and other migrants began to move in to take advantage of cheap retail space. In July 2018, the local council agreed to plans by the developers Delancey to pull the shopping centre down and replace it with a new town centre, new homes and student accommodation. This plan still needs to be approved by the Greater London Authority, but there are concerns about what will happen to the independent traders. Patria and the charity Latin Elephant have been campaigning with them to represent their interests and try and ensure their needs are accounted for as the shopping centre is pulled down and replaced. Okay, my name is Imad Migahed and I uh, run uh, Tech Room Limited basically to help uh, the community to find affordable IT solutions uh, in comparison to going somewhere, somewhere else. And we also do printing services. We have diverse services in th- in the area. That basically, when we done our plan, it, uh, uh, it basically it was apparent that it's needed in the area. What's set to be lost under the current plans for the shopping centre? It's not what's set to be lost. It's uh, what approach and and perception of people who work in the area that was taken by the developer. They were basically looked at us as if we were some kind of parasite that they have to get rid of. And uh, it took us uh, the actual uh, standing up together as a group and going to the council for them to do something. But if we didn't do that, nothing would have, done, would have been done. We just been, would have been pushed to one side. And what really triggered everything off is when we went to the first meeting, tenant meeting, to tell us we're going to redevelop the shopping centre. So we were asking questions, what's going to happen with us? Well, you've enjoyed affordable rental for a long time, so it's time to move on. What do you mean it's time to move on? <laughs> Things don't work that way. There's something called planning law, legal framework you have to work with. You can't just say to people, it's time to move on. 
well, we don't think you can afford the rent in this area and the wider, in the wider picture you, you might not fit. This is exactly their response. And it was kind of insulting because if you imagine the scenario, if you're a business person, you look at your client base and you see, okay, this client base is um, from that tier of the society. For example, the one, uh, in the, at the time when we first opened, they were very basically people who on low income. So you're not going to go and offer them a high chargeable kind of services and you're not going to basically decorate your shop in a way that will scare them away. So you want to make it very moderate, very kind of down and, uh, and put reasonable prices, affordable, to encourage them to come in because this is your biggest client base. But if your client base changes, then you change and you modify your business accordingly. So to say that we would not fit in the wide picture, how do you know? You don't know what we can do or what, what we can't do. You don't know what we can remodel, what skills we have. So you don't know anything about us. But yet you want to comment on our ability. So that was a real insult. They didn't give us the, <coughs> what you call, they didn't give us what really deserve, that we are human beings. One day we decided that we don't want to work for an employer. We want to utilize our own skills and time instead of selling it to somebody else and basically making our own money. And I think that takes a lot of courage and that should be rewarded. And it also we should look at us like intelligent human beings that we basically have made, one day have we taken that decision. So you shouldn't be insulting us by saying we're not going to fit in the wider picture. Um, this is saying basically we want a corporate level to come in and you guys moving out. The proposed demolition of the shopping centre comes hot on the heels of the controversial loss of the nearby Haygate estate, which was made up of 1,200 council homes. Southwark Council sold the estate to a developer for a mere £50 million. It has since been replaced by a luxury development of 3,000 homes, of which only around 80 are available for social rent. Dr Susie Hall is Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and the Director of the Cities Programme at LSE. Uh, Elephant and Castle, as part of a bigger landscape of transition, which is very much attached to the Haygate social housing estate, has seen what I would say is a profound scale of dispossession and human displacement. Um, when I started my PhD on the Walworth Road, which is attached to this area, in 2005, I always assumed that one of the things that would relatively protect um, some of the economic and cultural life was the presence, uh, the substantial presence of social housing estates. More recently, we were asked to do some work in partnership and collaboration with Latin Elephant to think about how we could make more evident to people involved in planning processes uh, the role of ethnic minority and in this case explicitly female traders who many of whom had made deep levels of investment at the Elephant and Castle over an extensive period of time but also uh, who were also being cast out of the, the, the regeneration vision. Um, so I, I would begin to think that this is not simply a, a natural process of what developers and planners like to call regeneration or renewal, but actually a systemic process of dispossession, and that is the displacement not only uh, of people from place, but in a way the displacement of people from any sense of their innate social value to the elephant and castle. And you've talked about some of the processes that are allowed to happen even before um, the regeneration itself starts to happen. Can you say something about that? Well, I mean, maybe taking the, the Elephant and Castle as an, as an exemplar in London, and explicitly the Haygate Estate, um, there are many people who would articulate either regeneration or gentrification as a natural process of renewal where one population gradually replaces another. Um, but I think what's evident when one looks at the Elephant and Castle in relation to what is happening globally at scale is that there is a, a large-scale, highly organized, systemic 
arrangement between the market and the state, which is about buying up certain parts of the city in order to either hold them for their real estate value or to transform them into something else in order to make profit. Susie explains the role of the financial crisis in amplifying this process. This shift has been most explicitly noticeable since 2008. And again, there's a pattern. If we went back to Neil Smith's wonderful classic book on gentrification, uh, he, he was looking at gentrification from the um, 1980s onwards uh, in places like New York, but also across Europe. And he identifies a number of structural factors. First of all, large scale so-called gentrification or regeneration tends to happen after a recession. Uh, and this is because global speculators or even national speculators are looking for a safe haven to put their money into. It also happens with the collusion of what we might want to call entrepreneurial planning. So planning is looking towards the city as being something that can um, present a grand statement to the rest of the world. And in this process of valuing, is a parallel process of devaluing. And so um, planners, property developers, politicians might be talking the talk about new chic urban lifestyles and uh, amazing projects associated with regeneration that bring in what they call either mixed communities or substantial renewal. But what we've also seen is the systemic process of devaluing. And the people who are most likely to be devalued are those who can least afford to remain. Um, and I think what we need to think very carefully about is the kind of language that has entered into the media and been widely circulated in the media of slackers uh, um, and the, the whole regard for mixed communities as if it's going to somehow be the salvation of poorer people to suddenly live next to middle class neighbors. Um, and this plays out particularly in the case of the Elephant and Castle where the Haygate becomes absolutely and explicitly targeted and represented as a sinker state. Haygate was um, uh, social housing publicly owned that was sold into private hands um, by a local authority that's responsible for housing people in the lower spectrum of the economic scale, where do those people go and live now? There's a fantastic map that's freely available on the internet, followed through by really important academics like Loretta Lees, that show that in fact there's been this almost shrapnel effect uh, of dislocation where many of the people who lived in the Haygate, and you've got to remember that the Haygate is a, a 10 minute bus ride to the river. Um, it right, is really in the center of things. Those people are largely dispelled from the center to the periphery, sometimes as far as uh, Addington, New Addington. And so we begin to hear stories of people, for example, who work for TFL, who have to get up early in the morning in order to service our tube stations who used to be able to wake up and get to work within half an hour and are now having to wake up an hour and a half before that in order to get to work. The costs of this in terms of human time uh, are absolutely inordinate and I think they haven't really been understood in terms of this process of regeneration. What, what is the human cost of displacement, the human cost of disposition? What is the elemental balance sheet of regeneration? Dr. Alan Mace is Associate Professor of Urban Planning Studies in LSE's Department of Geography and Environment. He's undertaken some work on what's happening in London suburbs. His research shows what he refers to as an upscaling of certain London suburbs in the private rented sector. People of lower socioeconomic status are being replaced by those with a higher socioeconomic status. His research suggests that there are cultural as well as economic reasons for this. We focus on the cultural question towards the end of the paper because we're interested in the significance of groups moving to outer London, possibly not through choice. So even though it's social upscaling, what we suggest in the paper 
is that some groups in the rented sector are moving out from inner London to outer London. In the data, they look like social, this, what they are socially upscaling, but possibly they themselves are being pushed out of inner London. They simply can't afford the inner London rental market. So one of the things we're then interested in uh, in the research is to ask, well, if people are being themselves forced out of inner London, these renters are being forced out of inner London to outer London, are they likely to be a sort of a bunch of dissatisfied uh, refugees from inner London um, and, and not very happy in outer London? And again, I think that has sort of significance for the stability and social well-being of outer London. So we then ask this question, well, if, if there is something cultural in gentrification, something that people value about the city, are there elements of, of this cityness that people might value that you can find in outer London. Now the interesting thing about outer London here is we often, or if you're a Londoner, you often associate it with 1930s suburban you know, interwar housing. But actually there's many areas of outer London that have Victorian housing, even Georgian housing in places. Uh, and one of the things we tested for through the data is whether there appeared to be any preference for this, these groups moving out to, to buy or rent into uh, Victorian housing. So the sort of aesthetic, the sort of kind of visual aesthetic and housing aesthetic you might expect people otherwise to be buying into in, uh, in Zone 2. And the, the second element we tested for was whether there seemed to be, uh, whether there was any evidence of people valuing being able to get back into the centre quickly. So in other words, if you were near to very good public transport links back into zone one uh, and you could rent a Victorian house, would this, is there any evidence this substitutes for the fact that you can't live in zone two as you, you may wish? And those two elements we did find um, were significant. So there was, you know, the evidence showed that there was some valuing both of old properties and of access back into the centre. And so what we argue is that the, the phenomenon we see in out of London with this social upscaling can be explained or can uh, acknowledge both the economic drivers of gentrification, that there seems to be a rent gap uh, that is being exploited in the particular case we're looking at. It's actually being exploited by the people who are renting out the property. But the second element, the cultural element we look at, is there is evidence to show that when these renters move out they value elements that we might consider to relate to cultural aspects of gentrification, type of property, access back to the centre. If working class people are being dispersed from the inner city and your research seems to suggest that they're being displaced from the suburbs, where are the working class people going? I think there are a few things happening here. So to start with the direct answer to the question. I think there are, there are two elements to that, which is first of all, I think, through housing policy, bedroom tax, etc. There's some movement out from inner London to outer London of um, groups lower down the um, classification scale, the, uh, the occupation classification scale. So you have some increase in what we might call the working class in outer London. And that's probably happening primarily within the rented sector, so moving from rented sector in inner London to outer London. But the other element that's uh, implicit in our research is that working class households who are probably um, owner, have been owner occupiers are then moving out from outer London to areas outside of London altogether. And they're part of a different story because many of them would have been owner occupiers they're in a position where they're going to be cashing in the equity of their property. And it might well be that for a number of those households, possibly a considerable proportion of those households who uh, may well be older, that they're cashing in equity and, and, and making a choice to move outside of London, to Hertfordshire, to Kent, to Essex, even Suffolk, Norfolk, um, as they become older and uh, are no longer so um, focused on London. So, there is probably a movement out of working class but from owner occupation where they have more choice 
and then there's a movement of working class from inner to outer London but in the rented section uh, sector where there is less uh, choice taking place. What, what our data doesn't show is one of the sort of limits of these large data sets is we, we don't know what the motivations are of the working class owner occupiers who have moved out so we don't know whether they're sitting in rural Kent or rural Essex and thinking this is the best thing I ever did I'm so glad I sold my house and moved or if they're sitting there sort of feeling well I would have liked to have stayed in outer London but I had no other choice. Working class displacement in the city is not just about physical displacement. Dr David Madden, Associate Professor in LSE's Department of Sociology, undertook research which shows the power of a name. Um, you did some research on renaming neighbourhoods as part of the regeneration gentrification process, um, specifically in New York. Um, what do you see as the problem with this? Okay, so I was trying to look at this question of displacement in a broader way. People, when they think about the problem of displacement, tend to see it as uh, an issue of direct displacement where households are forced to move from one part of the city to another or forced to move out of the city. I wanted to understand displacement in, uh, in, a, in a much more general sense, um, how people can not be directly displaced, um, but still their place within um, the, the sort of place within the city, the place within um, the urban political order can be lost. So I was looking at a public housing development in downtown Brooklyn in New York. Um, that was not displaced, it was not demolished, it was not privatized, it's still there, um, but the neighborhood around it became incredibly wealthy, incredibly expensive, um, and it was these these high-income households um, which sort of came to be defined as the neighborhood, and the residents of this public housing development were marginalized uh, from the urban agenda. I mean, the naming of the Dumbo neighbourhood raises some interesting issues about ownership and belonging. Can you say something about that? It's quite an interesting saga, this name Dumbo, because it was coined by people who had moved into f former factory buildings, sort of loft buildings um, near the waterfront, and they picked this name. It's, a, it's an acronym for Down Under the Manhattan Bridge, over, bridge Overpass. Um, they picked this name... Um, because they thought that it would sound so silly that no big developers would want to sort of move in and turn it into another Soho, because Soho and Manhattan um, had gone through this process um, not, too, uh, not too long before all this was happening. Um, and so it was sort of imagined as a token of resistance against, um, against sort of the powers of real estate. Um, but, I mean, if we sort of see Dumbo as a kind of, um, almost as a sort of political project or spatial project, as a, as a term I used in another article, um, we see that it, it even un defining the neighborhood as the space for artists uh, who see themselves as opposed to developers, this still marginalizes the working class um, residents of the public housing developments nearby. Um, so it's it, it's complex here, um, and that the, the there's people who sort of saw themselves as being opposed to real estate, um, in many ways were pushing forward this process of gentrification, um, and the, the sort of token of resistance um, didn't really work. Ultimately, um, the big developers were quite happy to adopt the name Dumbo and to draw on this idea of, of Dumbo as a space of, of sort of artistic energy. Um, and it's this this process of, of of saying that this is a place where artists live, or this is a place where people who like to go to art galleries live, or this is just a place where wealthy people who appreciate art live. Um, defining it that way, as opposed to an area with large numbers of working class and poor households that have a very different set of needs, um, it, it it legitimizes certain types of development and um, blocks others, um, and it promotes the. Uh, it promotes the neighborhood moving in one direction as opposed to another. And so I wanted to I wanted to try to see the question of gentrification in these terms. There's a really nice quote that you use from one of your interviews in the paper about, I think, one of the um, residents of the Farragut sort of musing on the irony of, depending on who he's speaking to, sometimes having to describe, you know, where he lives as being near Dumbo, 
whereas the Farragut was there, I believe, first. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, the, the residents of Farragut houses are very much aware about the politics of naming and um, sort of what it means. I mean, when, when you start seeing city maps identify the area as Dumbo, when the same maps produced by um, the, the Brooklyn, the local community board had previously identified it as Farragut, um, they're aware that this signifies a certain change in, in urban priorities. Um, and it, they're aware that this signifies their, 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 uh, their marginalization. And that's why I quote this activist who said, it feels like we're being pushed off the map. Some areas of our cities are in need of investment. I asked David whether regeneration was a choice between gentrification or decay. I think it's really important to get past this idea that those are the two options. I mean, this is something that warps debates about housing, about urban space all the time. I mean, you know, the, the sort of response to um, critics of gentrification is always, oh, what, you just, you, you want to see the city remain blighted? You want to see urban decay? Um, but as, uh, as housing activists and as um, urban scholars and many other people are constantly pointing out, um, to criticize gentrification is not to say that city, cities should stay the same. Um, and uh, it's not to say that, that cities shouldn't change. I mean, the, the debate is how should cities change? Um, so it's not uh, change or nothing. Uh, it is, what should cities be? How, how should they develop? Whose interests should they serve? Um, and so, I mean, the sort of specifics in any neighborhood will differ, but I mean, generally when, um, when this, this sort of false choice is posed, you have people objecting to a plan that would significantly displace working class and poor city dwellers in some way. Um, and uh, there's almost always an alternative that would allow them to stay, that would increase the amount of social housing or, or council housing, um, that would produce services and, and spaces that will meet the needs of, of non-wealthy city dwellers. I mean, that's, that's what the middle ground looks like. This sentiment is echoed by Patria Roman Velaquez at the Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre. I mean, the shopping centre has seen better days, hasn't it? It is about time that it was regenerated and new money brought into the area. No one um, disputes that the shopping centre could be, you know, could do with a sort of a refurbishment and the traders at the moment have loads of problems with maintenance of the shopping centre. It has been deliberately let to run down as well. So we need to take that into consideration as well. Uh, there are other alternatives to developing this shopping centre. But the traders are not opposed to development. They are opposed to being um, fragmented and to be in displaced and that is the main message that we keep saying all over across we're not opposing for the sake of opposing we're not opposing because we're opposed to development we're opposed to this development because it does not consider the benefit of the traders in the shopping centre. Elephant and Castle home to the now demolished Haygate estate is in inner London if you want to buy in the area today Prices start at around 270000 for an ex-council one-bedroom flat. Many people might want to live centrally in the city, but clearly at these prices, many cannot. I asked David Madden whether anyone really has the right to live anywhere in the city. It's not a matter of people having a right to live everywhere in the cities. Um, I mean, I think when you pose it that way, it it paints the anti-gentrification position in, um, in a slightly ridiculous way. They're not saying everyone, everyone has a, uh, a, a, a right to live wherever they want. Um, but I think in general, we can think about people having a right to urban life. Um, and that means not being displaced. Um, that, means, that means communities not being displaced. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's not, it, it, I think the people who are critiquing and, and struggling against displacement are not saying 
um, you know, every household should be able to just pick an address um, and and live there. Uh, so much as people should definitely have a right to security of tenure, um, to stability. Um, communities should have a right to uh, to their place in the city, um, and I mean. You know, people should have a right to not be precarious, and that's that's really the I think the if we want to get sort of more specific about what a right to the city would mean, then that's that's what it would mean a sort of right to a right to having a secure place. What needs to happen to stop the displacement of working class people from our cities? Here's Suzanne Hall. Well, you wouldn't think it necessarily exists thinking about the last decade of planning uh, across the UK, but explicitly in a place like London, but planning is there not simply to be entrepreneurial with respect to the market. Planning is there to respect and uphold the integrity of social justice. So the very first thing that needs to happen is no more selling of social housing estates. That is absolutely elemental. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that um, any sale of publicly owned land should be put through a far more rigorous process subject to real public scrutiny and accountability. Um, I think it is also possible to think about leverage mechanisms where if London has become uh, an equivalent to a kind of stock exchange where the land value or property value is a place of intense speculation that offers the promise of profuse profit um, then it wouldn't be untoward to think of a kind of taxation that's leveraged on property exchanges over a certain value. In terms of the suburbs, Alan Mace focuses on the need to understand what's happening in different outer London neighbourhoods and to adapt to those changes. So I think traditionally we've tended to see London in policy terms in two fairly, well, three fairly concentric circles of uh, inner London, outer London, and then the sort of green belt and the counties around the outside again. And that goes back to the 1940s and Abercrombie's plan for London. And I think once we overcome that sort of concentric circle model of London and start to think in fine grain terms, then we start to see some really uh, complex changes of both social upscaling and social downscaling happening, if not in neighbourhood, in their neighbouring terms, it's not next door neighbours, but in fairly close proximity to one another, then I think it's beholden on both the GLA and the Mayor, but also individual London boroughs in outer London to start to be more sensitive to the fine-grained nature of change that's happening. Including, for example, uh, one of the elements in outer London, one of the features of outer London linked to it being an area of owner occupation, is it's also been incredibly stable compared to inner London. So people you know, live in a particular property for far longer than they do in inner London. There's a slower turnover of residents. As you start to get an increase uh, in uh, renting and you get other social changes happening, then I think for all sorts of public services, most obviously education, but also health, then that, that, those increasing churn that you'll see with different tenures, uh, and also different demands on services with upscaling and, and social downscaling. All of this has implications for those services. And I think the need to start to understand what's happening and to predict some of the consequences of that for different public services will become uh, increasingly important. Is the gentrification of our global cities inevitable? Susie Hall. So I answer this question with a huge amount of emotion and concern. I think what has happened to London in the past 10 years in terms of the sale off of affordable housing and explicitly social housing, in terms of the vast quantities of young people having to leave the city because they can no longer afford to live here, has been an absolute catastrophe that could have been readily avoided had we had a far more astute form of regulation and planning in place. I think it is absolutely paramount to think about the system of gentrification as highly organized and poorly regulated. And I would say, therefore, that it is not an inevitable process at all. 
and that we need a whole political infrastructure that acts with courage, but that also acts with real care for its citizens. One of my underlying worries is that the pursuit of profit uh, through the market, but very much uh, hand in hand with the entrepreneurial state, has meant that the idea of the citizen has been removed from the idea of city. Here's David Madden. Gentrification of global cities is absolutely not inevitable. Um, gentrification is a, in some ways a creature of policy, in some ways a creature of, of politics in a, in a broader way. Um, it is uh, in many ways a reflection of contemporary inequality, but none of these things are inevitable. We could have more equal societies, more egalitarian societies. Uh, we could have different policies. We could have politics that um, empowers different people than those who are empowered now. And um, these things changed, then gentrification would, uh, would not happen, or at least wouldn't happen in the way that it does. And back to Petria at the Elephant and Castle. I don't think there is an inevitability, actually. I, I think that wherever you go, in the most central part of big mega global cities, you always find a little corner shop, a little migrant shop there, you know, my, you know owner of, of a BME background in there. And I have been to many cities and I can see that. They, there's always something and I think there's a value in having that. And I think that we shouldn't lose that. What do you think? Tell us using the hashtag LSEIQ. This episode was based in part on the following research. Socioeconomic value at the Elephant and Castle by Julia King, Suzanne Hall, Patria Roman Velasquez, Alejandro Fernandez, Josh Mullins, Santiago Felufo Sonira and Natalie Perez. Tenure change in London suburbs, spreading gentrification or suburban upscaling, by Antoine Pacou and Alan Mace, and Pushed Off the Map, Toponymy and the Politics of Place in New York City by David Madden. For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and SoundCloud, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review on the Apple Podcasts app or on iTunes as it makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover. Join us next time when we ask, can activism really change the world?